Andrew Langer, welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. We'd love for you to just share some opening comments about America's principle of a meritocracy, and then we'll go to questions. All right, guys, I, I hate to say this. Um, you're going to have to bear with me here because I'm, I'm not sure we're cutting in and out. Um, I do apologize for that. Uh, I don't understand why it's not out of everything. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Good. All right. Well, then there you go. Well, then I'm not going to worry about it right now. If I cut out, I cut out. I, I apologize. So this, this was a really interesting essay to me because this is an issue that um, we are grappling with as a society today, um, but it gets down to the fundamentals of who we are as a people. This idea uh, that we are a nation in which people are supposed to rise and fall based upon their own achievements and not according to the status of who they were when they were born, uh, some sort of uh, some sort of professional class, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it was very uh, important to the founding fathers, many of whom themselves uh, had not been born out of uh, some kind of aristocracy. Uh, many of them were, of course, uh, but nevertheless, even uh, aristocracy, uh, they still had to rise and fall on their own achievements. Nobody was participating in the Continental Congress or the Constitutional Convention uh, based upon some semblance of their parentage or some other uh, aspect uh, that they brought to the table, save for what they were able to contribute. Um, and so, you know, this American society, as it was a new thing, uh, all people were created, they were endowed by their creator with these inalienable rights, and that you had this idea of an equality of opportunity as opposed to an equality. And that's the that's sort of the 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 sort of the basis the basis of this, and it it plays itself out in terms of our society, because it's one of those conditions that allows the society to prosper and to remain stable. Uh, a because it starts with this idea that everybody has a stake in society. When you have a society that is stratified on classes based upon. Uh, um, then you have a certain group of people that don't feel that they have any stake in that society. And so the society becomes unstable and untenable, and the possibility of revolution uh, always grows closer. But more, almost more, I would say, actually, let's not say more importantly, but as important in terms of both the economics, in terms of the actual market economics, uh, but also the marketplace of ideas, this idea that the best ideas are promoted uh, ahead of, of of lesser ideas and and that the best ideas are the ones that get adopted. Uh, that's both the surest way to solve public policy problems and to grapple with political issues. But in terms of the market economy, it's also the surest way towards uh, uh, innovation. And therefore, there's the phrase, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door. And that is one of the essences of American society. Now, of course, other societies have adopted this, but certainly we were um, among the first of, of nations to sort of put this out there in the modern, in the modern era. Uh, and of course, a lot of this is born out of uh, uh, ideas of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, uh, but really in terms of incorporation into society, it's, the, it's one of the primary things, right, that separates us uh, and separated us from uh, Great Britain, from our parents. SM, right? You know, uh, you had certain rights that you were guaranteed in great our own Bill of Rights and the concept of natural law born out of John Locke, all of which, you know, borrowed from um, the, you know, the Anglo law. But of course, in Britain, you still have a titled aristocracy and that titled aristocracy at the time, especially the revolution, held enormous power. We, we sort of took that and turned it on its head uh, we obviously, in the same way that the British Parliament has two houses, a House of Commons and a House of Lords, and right, you had this balancing of interests in Great Britain between uh, folks who were elected of the people and by the people, and then, of course, folks who came out of the titled aristocracy. We adopted that, but turned it on its head, right? So we had our we have our House of Representatives in which, I, well, anybody can run. And then, of course, at the time of the founding, we had a United States Senate where people would be selected again we would hope out of their own merits uh, by state legislatures, 
to sit in our United States Senate. Um, and, and, and that sort of moved things forward. Now, of course, in a, in a fit of, uh, of peak over democracy and cherishing democratic ideals, we got rid of the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the selection of senators out of state legislatures, and we moved to the, direction, the direct election of senators with the, uh, the adoption and ratification of the 17th Amendment. We can debate the merits of the 17th Amendment. I'm happy to, happy to, to talk about this. Let's just take a quick step backwards because I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, let's remember that among our founding fathers, as I said, many of them were aristocrats or came out of aristocratic backgrounds, but you always had folks like George Washington, probably the most universally respected of all of the founding fathers. Uh, George Washington, yes, he came out of a somewhat aristocratic family. They were an agrarian family, but Washington rose to prominence, not because his family was an important family, but because George Washington had done service as a surveyor and as a frontiersman, and then did great service as a colonel in the army during the uh, during the French and Indian War. And, and so he rose to prominence in that way. Uh, Benjamin Franklin in the same vein. Um, uh, John Adams, I, I you know, didn't mention in my essay, but Adams certainly was part of the Boston family. But John Adams rose to prominence not because uh, uh, he came from the right family, uh, but because he had courage and daring and was willing to uh, be a deep thinker on the important issues of the day. Um, in terms of how it plays out, you know, as I think I mentioned, meritocracy is never mentioned by our founding fathers. We we that's a, a fairly modern. Um, but in itself, we don't have hereditary offices, as I mentioned. Uh, people are supposed to be elected uh, on their own merits. We could talk about how that may have changed in the political system today. Um, we have uh, our system of checks and balances, which is sure that the best ideas are moved forward uh, while the worst ideas are dismissed. Um, but we have a real struggle today with this idea of abandoning. I'm not going to get into some specific issues, but there are people who want to exchange other values for those of the idea of people rising and falling on their own merits. The problem with that is, in any kind of a system, the great thing about meritocracy, now it's not an, an objective system in the truest sense of, you're not measuring objective criteria that are easily ranked and, and, are, and are put out there, but in a meritocracy, by virtue of the fact that people are picking and choosing folks based upon their abilities, uh, their successes, what they're bringing to the self is a much more objective measurement than folks who want to institute all kinds of other subjective ideals. And the problem with instituting subjective ideals as opposed to letting people rise and fall on their merits is that this allows for the possibility, A, it allows for the possibility of cronyism and kinds of corruptions to, to, to sink in or to sneak into a system. Um, you know, if you have a system where the best are not being picked based upon the best, but we're setting up a, a system of metrics. Whoever is setting up the system of metrics to determine how we choose some product or something, they're always going to be able to game the system for the folks that appeal to them. The other part of this, you put your thumb on the scale away from as much as you can approach an objective meritocracy, um, then then you you are stifling innovation because you're not giving people the ability to count on their own abilities to achieve and to create better products or better ideas. Um, if they don't have an investment in their own system, uh, then then they're just not going to invest. And and we've you know we've we've seen this um, in uh, in places like the Soviet Union. Uh, now, Soviet Union is a prime example of this. Uh, just to get into some brief, very brief Russian history. The idea of the Soviet Union, first, they were supposed to guarantee equality of outcomes. Obviously, they couldn't do that. And yes, if you were talented in the Russians, in the Soviet system, you could rise in certain ways. But in the Soviet system, because they placed adherence, and, and I'm going to say this, slavish adherence to Marxist-Leninist dogma above anything else, loyalty to the party above anything else, you could be the most brilliant scientist, the most brilliant uh, the most brilliant inventor. And if you weren't adhering 
to the the dogmatic views of the Soviet system of politics, well, then you would be punished. You would be kept out of the successes. And we saw what happened there in the 70 years of Soviet history. The Soviets never really invented anything. Uh, the Soviets never really, I mean, we, well, I mean, we could talk about going to, the, going, going to space, but, but I, I guess the space race in and of itself is emblematic of, of where the Soviets failed and how the Soviet system and the lack of meritocracy failed. You know, the Soviets used German ingenuity and engineering to jumpstart their space program, but they couldn't get any further than heavy lifting. Why? Because they weren't rewarding success and innovation. They weren't rewarding the best ideas to get in, in, uh, into space. Um, so, you know, it, it, this is, we, we, we can, sorry. We are at a very dangerous point if we start to consider for those very self-same reasons. The things that have made America, to me, the greatest, most exceptional nation on earth, they start to wane and they start to wither. And we run the risk of being eclipsed by those who do honor the best and the brightest. Uh, it leads us down a road of stifled innovation, the potential for cronyism, and greater corruption. And I've got all sorts of other notes, but I want to leave. I, I want to leave plenty of time for questions. So let me open up the floor there. Is that okay? Is that okay, Kathy? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Just wonderful overview. And again, Thanks. the essay that you wrote uh, that I know we're putting in the Q and A link is such a great essay. We've got several uh, fans in the audience who've already mentioned how much they enjoyed your essay. Thanks. And I just I loved uh, one of the observations that you made in your essay. And you just made just now in your opening comments about the system of checks and balances uh, being implicitly merit, merit, I don't even know how you'd say it, meritocratic. Yeah, meritocratic. <laughs> that would be right. Meritocracy. Yes. Um, I never thought about that before. It was a great point. Thanks. But I know we've got some, a lot of questions lined up. So I'm going to toss it to, to Janine. Hello. Thank Hi. you, Andrew Langer. Terrific as always. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to break down a, a few things for the youth who is joining us and the, the students. Um, and so if we'll just do some kind of, what do they call it, lightning round answers, right? Sure. Okay, define the word meritocracy, please. Uh, a system where people rise and fall based upon their individual achievements and nothing else. Their achievements, okay. Yeah. And with, with, with abilities? Sure, abilities and or? achievements. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, included in meritocracy would be abilities and achievements, but that would also be included in order to have those achievements, like a willingness to work and right. a, have a, a work a, ethic. Absolutely. A drive, a drive to, to strive. Yes, absolutely. A drive to strive. I yeah. like that. A drive to strive. Yes. Thanks. Okay. So, <laughs> so a, a work ethic, a drive to strive, those, those are all part of meritocracy because of meritocracy is is uh ability and achievements and it's based on your your willingness to go out there and and uh work hard and, and to yeah to do that okay and so our country to break all this down a little bit more is based on meritocracy not on aristocracy right and i think it would be interesting the further we get away in america from what it was really like I think that it would be interesting to talk about aristocracy or, or and you could even correlate it to today with, with dictatorships. We are just oblivious in this world. You know, I, I, we have a lot of hardships. Everybody has their pain. I don't want to stereotype, but we, we, we're just out of touch um, right. with the way, way it used to be. And I think for anyone to really appreciate what meritocracy, that we are a country based on meritocracy Let's talk about what aristocracy was really like for those who haven't watched every, uh, you know, Netflix series on uh, some historical piece. But, you know, the thing that I would throw out to you is, is you, if you were born in, in not into a, a landed family, that means a family with a lot of land and they were part of the nobility and they were dukes or, or whatever, you know, whatever they were, earls princes at the court if you weren't a part of that and you were part of the feudal system that was further down and and you were you had no way to work your way up 
or it was or it was very deep. you had to be a, a truly exceptional and probably would never be fully accepted as a member of society you didn't you didn't have uh the you know the right the right connections the right family name the right bloodline um absolutely so you could be you could be brilliant you know it would take you would have to find uh, some folks had just spent some time in in Italy and, and touring Central Europe, right? You could be Michelangelo, or you could be well. I, I actually I'm not even sure what Leonardo da Vinci's background was, but you could be a Michelangelo, and you would need the Medici's to be uh, and essentially you know take on your your role. You could you could be um, um, Mozart, right? And, and Mozart, truly brilliant uh, a composer and musician. But Mozart needed, you know, the prince of um, uh, of uh, the Archduke of. Sorry, now I'm going to say this. Vienna as his patron, um, or the emperor as his patron, in order to couldn't sort of he couldn't go out there and sort of uh, live by by his own by his own wits and and succeed and grow in society. Like you know, in contrast, I'll give you a good contrast to this. Barishnikov. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Mikhail Barishnikov. But Mikhail Baryshnikov uh, was a, a he is uh, a, a dancer, a very famous ballet dancer who defected from the Soviet Union to the United States in either the late '60s or the early '70s. You know, Mikhail Baryshnikov had no family name; he wasn't part of uh, aristocracy in Russia. He was able to live and learn, and and because he towed the party line in Russia, he was able to succeed. But when he knew that he couldn't do it anymore, he he defected and became a a, a celebrity dancer and and I and, and an iconic figure here in in America because of his merits because of his abilities and because of his drive to work hard etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. You, know, you you think about that you know all of the people who are you know there obviously are people who are famous because of their family name but you think of the true truly great achievers in American society again we talk about uh, uh George Washington another prime example is Abraham Lincoln probably the greatest president who ever lived you know, you can make the debate between Lincoln and, and, and Washington, but you, the the best example of of, of the 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 anti aristocracy and the ability to achieve in America, a guy who was not an attractive man, sort of freakish looking, um, yet and and a self made self taught man who who rose to not only become president of the United States but to hold on and keep this union together and to win the civil war um, and, and then bring, try to bring America together afterwards only to find himself shot. He is the, the, you know, sort of the ultimate example in meritocracy. And, you know, it's interesting because it, it how I actually am, am, have had the great pleasure of being friends with Mikhail Baryshnikov oh. and um, I knew him, I met him in the eighties and we're still friends today. And what I learned from watching him, in the eighties is just how hard he worked. Oh yeah. Diligently every day. And we tend to look at these people that have the spotlight and we think, Oh, look at their, you know, their easy life. And it's not easy. Uh, you know, dance classes every day, rehearsing every day, you know, 12 point and acting's the same way, really, you know, you're 18 hours on a set. And it, so it's, it's working hard, working hard, working hard. And, uh, the same thing with Lincoln. I mean, I'm reading Lincoln's biography right now, yeah. and it talks about how he was just incredibly curious yeah. and driven, and would would just sit on his off hours and debate people in front of the in front of the fireplace. He he just has an insatiable, I believe, curiosity. And so I want to turn it over to to others to ask questions, but I I'd like to round off this section with, you know, you were talking about the checks and balances and, and the rights that we have. And that's a big part of preserving meritocracy oh, yeah. because it, we have to have justice in the country. And we, we've had that conscience that was put forth and with the declaration of independence. And we've, we've had to stair step our way out of you know the mire into enlightenment. And we're continuing to enlighten here in America, but it's uh, it, it, we wouldn't be able to have meritocracy which means the ability with hard work to have equality, you know, um, right. life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If we didn't have the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that protects the Declaration of Independence, 
Um, if we don't have that, we don't have the ability like a Lincoln. Lincoln, I think this is this is the final. Lincoln would have had no potential really to rise in England or any of those other right. countries. Um, and and the fact that because he just would have he wouldn't have been accepted into into those areas. So I I, I think that that is, you can demean America all you want, but we still have this wonderful, we try, we're not perfect, but we try, right. you know, people right. can, can start out from nothing and make something of themselves. Remember, and we see that within a couple of generations, usually, um, including in my own family. Remember you know? Janina, we've all talked about this before. The constitution is an aspirational document. Yes. It's about who we are. It's about the rules. It sets out the rules and structure of our government. But ultimately, it is an aspirational document in order to form a more perfect union. That's what we're doing. We're striving for ever closeness to perfection. Yep. There you go. Yeah. We have the conscience of the Declaration of Independence. That's our, but, you know, men are not angels, so we, we stray. Right but we had those checks and balances uh, in the constitution. But anyway, anyway, great. I love this. I'm so thanks for explaining the word meritocracy. You're welcome. So that people understand this, this new word that are listening today and uh, how unique that is to America and how then it, it permeated across the world. What an example we were. And I think in closing, I will just say there's still a lot of countries today that do not have the ability to have right. meritocracy, um, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, places in Africa and South America. I mean, it's, we just take it for granted here. It's a wonderful thing that we still have it. We have a Republic if we can keep it. Yes. Okay. I'm going to pass it, pass it to Tova. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thanks so much for being on and, and giving that great overview of the idea of meritocracy, something that's definitely uh, important to talk about. Um, but I wanted to ask about um, how it seems to me that the idea of meritocracy has sort of been coming a bit under fire. Um, right. In, in modern times, for instance, one of the most popular classes at Harvard is this class called Meritocracy and its Critics. That's kind of the critique, I mean, supporting the general idea of meritocracy, but a lot of people today, I think, believe that there is a danger in meritocracy where um, you know, people might say there are, I guess, more systemic barriers like poverty and lack of education that might um, if you're sort of just having a blind system that is just based on like test results or something, um, it, it might not account for those deeper barriers. And that leads to like a, a larger general discussion of, I guess, equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. Right. Um, where uh, We say the word meritocracy, but not everyone agrees on what that means. So some but people might think that means that everyone should just have the same opportunity to enter the system, whereas others think that that should mean you know, there's equality of outcomes. Just what, what is, what is your response to, I guess, the most modern criticisms of meritocracy um, and how would you respond? There are two things that are going on and I'm going to give you the university view first, um, which is the, the, the real, it's not weedy, but it's part of the problem. One of the problems we have is that about 30, 40 years ago, um, a, who were critical of the American system um, and and the, the the sort of the tenets of originalism um, and the concepts of meritocracy, um, they started attacking these issues and they sort of turned it on its head. And and in polling data, um, and you can look at those, a political scientist named Alan Abramowitz, who is how I sort of came to understand this. And again, this is not, this is me critic. Um, things like self-reliance, and the ability to rise and fall on one's own merits and the belief in those things. I guess that's the point. These group of, this group of political scientists started calling that the resentment index, that, that if, you were, if you were critical of efforts to undo these meritocracy systems, that meant that you were expressing some kind of resentment, which I think is hogwash. Um, so so it starts it starts with that. It's sort of it's sort of understanding that they've flipped the perspective on its head. And instead of meritocracy being what we strive for, it's being critical of meritocracy as somehow being an unfair system, as though, again, if you work hard, uh, you study hard, you think hard, you work to achieve as though that should not be rewarded. The other part of the issue, as you point out, and this gets into really the thing that we can all understand is the difference between equality of opportunities and equality of outcomes. 
Um, and and that's what most of the criticism for C issue uh, comes from folks who believe that we should have some semblance of a quality of outcomes. And there are other ways that this plays into sort of modern politics. The problem is you cannot have a system which ever guarantees a quality of outcomes. Uh, the only way you can do that is essentially by uh, taking things to their lowest common denominator. And again, you can point to that has attempted to uh, uh, create an equality of outcomes, and they don't, they just don't don't work. It either bankrupts a society or it leads to some kind of a tyranny, or it creates uh, um, um, a society in which the realities of the poverty is, is of, of society are hidden. And again, you can look at the various flavors of communism, Marxist Leninism, socialism, what have you, you know, whether it is China obfuscating things. And China's a little different because they sort of vacillate between capitalism, but they still have quite the the caste system. A caste system is a kind of class system where you can be sort of in, in different levels. The Soviet Union and the various Soviet satellite states being prime examples of, of, of these systems. The other part of it, of course, is that, again, when you have a small group of people who are determining what the equality of outcome is, invariably this leads to some kind of corruption or some kind of cronyism. It's not just about uh, abuse of power and totalitarianism. When you are creating the structures that are artificially looking at these outcomes uh, and you have somebody behind closed doors sort of pulling the strings, well, they can pull the strings however they want. Um, and, and I'm sorry, Kathy, if we don't, if you don't want me to talk about, this is a, a particular issue right now, let me know. But it's, it's, you know, part of the debate over college admissions, for instance, um, you know, you have folks who are talking about getting rid of standardized tests as a way of trying to make things more equal. Well, no, what that really does is it creates a new set of criteria that are hidden from the public view that, that if you are applying to a college and you don't know what criteria they're using, you can never sort of figure it out. So they can sort of pick and choose who they want. Whereas again, a standardized test that, that is, gives you some kind of a, an objective me uh, metric. Now, I understand that there are some people who are not good test takers. And I understand that there are some people who can be disadvantaged in terms of their educational systems, but that really points to creating those conditions where there's an equality of opportunity as opposed to an equality of outcome. Well, great. Um, thank you for you know providing that perspective. Uh, another question I had was with regards to this uh, really interesting essay on meritocracy that you published. Thank you. Um, there was this one section that I thought was particularly interesting where you talk about the systems of checks and balances and how that can actually strengthen meritocracy. Um, just to read it out for the audience who might not have read it. Um, you write that the system of checks and balances, another cornerstone of the U.S. Constitution, is also implicitly meritocratic. It requires that individuals in power continually demonstrate their abilities and merits in order to maintain their position. So I thought that that was really interesting and not really a perspective that I'd heard. So could you explain a bit more um, on what you mean by that and, yeah, and what me, structural aspects of our government enhance meritocracy? Let me talk about a really specific one, because I think, listen, I how the how the Supreme Court balances out Congress and the executive branch now the executive branch but but I want to talk specifically about the regulatory process uh, because that's something I you know that that is Kathy mentions very near and dear to my heart it's something I'm working on right now and so you have a system in which in which Congress passes a law and then the executive branch uh, is in charge of interpreting and enforcing those laws and the way that they go about interpreting those laws is through this thing called the regulatory process. So for instance, Congress passes the Clean Water Act and the Clean Water Act says you can't pollute a navigable water of the United States. Congress didn't define what pollute or navigable or water of the United States means to decide this. And so it starts with, like, let's say the EPA wants to do a rulemaking on waters of the United States. They put out a proposal and then under federal law, something called the Administrative Procedure Act, that the, the the public gets to look at that proposal and they get to comment on it. And then depending on what the public says substantively, the agencies are then required to respond to those comments. 
And if they don't respond to those comments or they don't make changes based upon those comments, then the people who commented can turn around and challenge the law in court. Again, the system of checks and balances. So it's 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 constantly going. And the idea is that we're supposed to, you know, rules that are out there. So if an agency does something, I'll give you a really good example. About uh, 15, 20 years ago, the EPA wanted to... Um, the EPA wanted to deal with uh, uh, tailpipe emissions from tractors. They wanted to make it so that tractors were cleaner. And they were mandating that every farmer in America had to put this box on their engine uh, to make their emissions more clean. Nobody had ever thought about how this would actually physically work until one farmer looking at this proposal sent in a comment and said, listen, I appreciate what you're doing here, but I physically can't close the hood of my engine. If you make me put this on my engine, what are you going to do about this? And it stopped the rulemaking cold. Now, of course, they came back later on and sort of worked on it. But but the, the point is, in the end, again, you have Congress doing I, and then you have an individual being able to step out there. Or I'll give you a, another example, sort of how this goes. Again, I'll use the EPA because they seem to be a, a ripe target. Um, EPA decides that they want to completely remake our energy economy um, by using vague language within the Clean Air Act. Well, a state, West Virginia, looks at this and says, you can't do this. You can't turn around and remake an entire sector of the economy based upon some very small language. And then they have to go and challenge it in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, yeah, you know something, EPA? We have this thing called the Major Questions Doctrine. And that says that you can't take small pieces of statutory or regulatory language and jam a huge new regime through it. So that's that's what we're talking about here. It it, it gets into you know the best ideas. Now it doesn't always work. Um, I could I can name a, a bunch of examples in which it it doesn't always work. Um, but generally, especially when it comes to things like court cases, the best arguments are the ones that are supposed to hold sway. Um, so anyway, so that's. That's uh, um, that's at least one example. Did I did I get to that, Tova? Yes, you did. Yeah, Good. thanks for uh, expanding on that idea. Um, and then my my final main question was, um, you know, we talk about meritocracy in sort of opposition to other systems like nepotism or favoritism, cronyism. Um, but how do we prevent, like, if we have a meritocratic system, how do we prevent? you know, favoritism or nepotism or these other biases from taking hold? Um, like, how do we ensure that the people who are able to meritocratically climb their way to the top don't then just impose their own systems onto us or, you know, someone works their way to the top of a structure and then hires their son or then hires people who pay them money? Like, what what guardrails can we well, put in place? Part of this has to do with transparency. I think I think you, you, raise, a, you raise a good point. This is certainly something that we are all discussing right now. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm reminded of, well, anyway, I, there, there are lots of examples of, of this, but it starts with, it starts with transparency, right? The idea that, that these kinds of transactions should be transactions isn't the right word. Operations should be open and available for examination for, for the, for the, you know, the public to see. Um, the other part of this is setting up good, strong rules to prevent that. Again, um, um, you know, the, we have a, uh, for instance, in the federal civil service, you have the Merit Systems Protection Board, I think is what it's called, which is supposed to sort of protect folks who can rise and fall within um, uh, the, the the federal system in, in that way. The other part of this is, and this is especially true when it comes to cronyism, but I think it would apply also when you're talking about nepotism and favoritism, right? The, what drives people to um, what drives people to want to engage in systems like that to do favors for their friends or favors for their patrons or to uh, bring family members forward uh, um, or friends or whatever is the amount of power that any that any governmental has. We're talking about government here. Um, and so the less power that government has to make sort of financial decisions, to pick winners and losers in a marketplace or to make a, a big decisions that impact huge swatches of the economy, um, the 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 less of an imp impetus there is. If you look at almost all of the examples, corruption um, in American government, especially, well, I would say in the last hundred years, um, it almost always comes down to the ability of government to pick some kind of winner or loser or to put pressure on an agency to reward some group of friends 
uh, or some family member or what have you. Um, and so to me, the answer always has been, and the answer, like whenever government abuses its power, the answer is, well, then you take back that power. You you make sure the government entity that had that power has less of it. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to pass on now to Jewel and Jorn, but thank you for your time. Hello, Jewel and Jorn. Hello. Uh, thanks so far for the insights. I think that it's interesting to talk about meritocracy and to place its importance in our minds and realize that that is something that also we may take for granted. And then also think about what, like we were just saying, what types of systems then would we have? What would our lives look like if we were not attempting to be a mer a meritocratic society? I wanted to point to some a big a big statement first, which is this: um, uh, meritocracy makes big value claims. It believe it it underneath the principle says that there is it's better to be good it's better to be effective um it says that there is an objective standard in a way you're making a claim that there is you could stretch meritocracy and say it can only really exist in a society that believes in truth itself mm. um today we've seen well we'll go back C celebrity is important for the public because we pick our heroes from um, the Iliad and, and these Greek heroes. The heroes were a idea that was set forth that the public emulated those heroes, whether flawed or not, for certain right. aspects of their character and for certain things that we reveal who we are by who we choose to emulate. Sure. Today, there has been a, 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 a pretty crazy overhaul of celebrity. So in, let's just say there was a big change around, you know, 60s, 70s, the 80s, we had these celebrities who were extremely, extremely talented. And then, uh, but it was publicly known that they led, you know, maybe very immoral lives yeah. and don't maybe emulate those part of their lives, but they are, they are insanely talented. But today we have algorithms and we have celebrities that are created that there is nothing fundamentally that they can do that you can't. Yeah. And yet they are put on a pedestal and we as a culture emulate these people. Our kids and people my age and then people my age as students and uh, that forth all of us are kind of responsible for this system. And I've seen it as something that's been very destructive to meritocracy. Right. That is something we all come in contact with, with our everyday life. But I don't know if, um, I find, I think it's very un-American. Uh, and I was like, just, you could say something uh, maybe well, sure. about that. Right. Listen, when you have a situation in which, what is it, 60% of young people, I don't remember the ages there, would be more than willing to give up their right to vote if uh, uh, if they were able to increase their TikTok viewership, there, there's, a, there's a real problem in society uh, uh, because of that. You know, here here's the thing, and this is, this is why organizations like Constituting America are so important, and I know we all get this, otherwise we wouldn't all be here, um, because we need to have a return to the discussion of first principles and who we are as a people and our common ground. And part of the problem is, is that we've had essentially about 50, 60 years, five, six decades now, where there has been a real tearing um, at the fabric of who we are as a people. So the, the same people who are calling for uh, uh, questions to a system of meritocracy are the same ones who are also denigrating uh, uh, who we were are as an American society, who are you know uh, the founding of America and tearing at that and it it so it it creates these skewed visions of who we should be as a society, but also and then it has these other tendencies of making it impossible for us to come together as a people. We don't have any common heritage, uh, sort of common frame of reference from which we can come to. I, I had a conversation with somebody this morning uh, on on a radio show uh, about that about that very issue about the issue of. Uh, the inability of people to be able to come together. And there are people out there who want this. And again, to go back to Tova's question, right? 
the same people who want cronyism, the same people who want to be able to do favors for their friends and gin a system in which they can pick the winners and losers, regardless of the merits of those folks who are out there and what they're bringing to the table. They're the same folks who are also calling for, and uh, you know, uh, saying that America was founded on, you know, by racist white men. And therefore, uh, you know, that, uh, that therefore the principles upon which we were founded uh, are hypocritical or they're dangerous or some other thing. And we need to change those, those situations. The only way to turn back on them um, is to engage in a massive education effort um, and, and to make the case for people that this is why these things happen the way they do. This is why these things are, are important. And yes, as I, I think it was Janine who just said, our, our founding fathers were not perfect, but again, and, and America is not a perfect society. Constitution is, a, is an aspirational document. We, we aspire to be better. Um, the, and just bringing it really back to like, uh, our everyday lives i think that a lot of people most of us on this podcast and all of our wonderful listeners you know we're lucky that we grew up and someone told us or we found out ourselves that that um our lives are much better when we love our country and we learn these principles um but everybody that we meet is not necessarily in that same place and these are discussions that this is a really real discussion that we can have that pretty much everybody can understand because everybody's gone through some something where they thought a favorite was picked right and and but when we are constantly our topics of discussions and our celebrities and who we're all looking at on our phones as if is a really a cele- a false celebrity in some way who is put there because of what you just said in some form of that they were like uh, picked uh, it's cronyism you're being able to pick the winners and losers we could go through almost every industry and there is an issue like in we could go finance right. we could go entertainment and there's been a lot of winners and losers that are picked and um and i and i think we're seeing a lot of those effects in our culture because i think that another term i could say is that um art imitates life but life also imitates art and you can stretch 100%. that to to other areas too and um i don't know how many of us would be uh, mozart fans if we had to find him on tiktok right right you know or or you that's that's right or you or you hear the the song behind somebody's tiktok and you have no idea who it is or or where they or where they got to and and, that's great i just have to say that's great jewel yeah (laughs) we'd be mozart fans if we had to find him on tiktok well what what if mozart didn't have a good uh, instagram of following this is really a great conversation that we're having here very good so you know in in the end right this is where it it you know connections with people which again is very hard to do in 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 this day and age uh and engaging in this education effort listen i have great faith in america i mean as 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 janine just said it's we have a republic so long as we can keep it you know obviously is that that we live in a society in which we do what we can to tear down folks. There's an inherent skepticism on the part of the major media uh, to tear it at, at good individuals who get involved in public folks up to try to uh, make them as, as perfect as possible. And they're never are perfect people. But the reality is the the disservice we've done is we've created an environment in which only the most brutal uh, or the the or I'm, I'm not going to say I'm not going to be that cynical and say it's only the most brutal or only the most corrupt, but we are we are moving towards at an ever increasing pace uh, the situation that that uh, William Butler Yeats predicted in the Second Coming, where the best lack all conviction while the worst are filled with passionate intensity, and we have to do what we can to make sure that the best of us feel that they can uh, uh, have that same kind of passionate intensity. And I, I see a handful of folks on the, uh, on the public stage who, 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 who represent that. Not many, but there are some. Real quick, before we get to audience questions, I just, uh, could you talk a little bit about um, meritocracy in, how meritocracy in government, you know, is a necessity, let's say. But when you look at it, when you look at, um, if you're a small business, you know, and I own my business, it is, it is very different 
me wanting to hire my brother compared to the government compared to a senator wanting to appoint his brother well well right and, and, point, and, you know and, what i mean there's there's that well that, that gets into the difference private and sort of what you do in your private life and with your private business and the risks you're willing to take to hire your brother or, or otherwise listen i i get into this you know i i when i had a my baby brother was just starting out in life and recommending him for uh a certain jobs with friends you know or my middle brother was the same thing you know there's a certain degree of anxiety that goes into this because my reputation is on the line and 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 i want them to to do best what happens if they don't and and that is the danger in all of this right if i just knew some great student at the time who was coming out and i can make that recommendation unabashedly um but again because the the because the 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 government it's not just us but at the at its most base terms right they're using our money to to influence great amounts of power or to exercise great amounts of power we have to take the extraordinary steps to make sure that everything is done according to hoyle because they're spending my money on it or they're spending sure it's not being wasted and it's not being abused and it's not being stolen okay thank you i think we got thanks. some audience questions this was a, a fun show thanks well thank you for those great questions and we want to give a shout out to our listeners on las vegas's kkvv 1060 a.m uh, KKVV airs our podcast on monday evenings in las vegas at 6 p.m pacific so uh, Thank you for that. And we also want to give a shout out to our students and our uh, teachers and classrooms who are with us here today. We have Sherry Stegel with several students uh, out in Arizona watching. We have Fred uh, Persley with Mansfield Classical Academy with uh, six students watching. And we have Lisa Padgett uh, with several students watching in Colorado, as well as Cami Waynehouse, uh, homeschool parent uh, with a student watching. So if you are a student or a teacher watching and we didn't give you a shout out, be sure and, and write us in our chat and we will recognize you as well because we really appreciate having you all with us. Now, um, Andrew Robert uh, Seedorf made a great comment. He said, Hamilton is a great example of a founding father who rose from almost nothing, which right. is great to remember. And then uh, Robert also says, thank you for mentioning the 17th Amendment. It's so many times overlooked. Would you want to uh, elaborate a little bit more on the 17th Amendment? Well, the question becomes, right, the 17th Amendment is the one that that has the direct, direct election of senators. And and there it was enacted at a time, and again, talking about the issues of meritocracy and issues of democracy and populism, um, the if there was something that could be, if there was a, a, a an apparatus, a structure that could be abused or could be it be used for cronyism, um, selecting using state legislatures, state legislatures to select somebody um, directly elected. And there are a number of scholars, and I point to uh, Todd Zawicki from George Mason University Law School as a as a prime example. He's written extensively about this, and Todd and I have had a bunch of conversations about it. He's actually, for those of you who are out in Colorado, Todd's a, a visiting scholar at uh, uh, University of Colorado Boulder this fall. Apparently so, that one of the problems is that when you have the direct election of senators, the senator is only accountable but once every six years to his electorate, and then it's a statewide electorate. And so for, let's say, five of those six years, the senator can just sort of go off and do whatever that senator wants without any real accountability. Whereas if the state, if the senator is directly responsible and can be recalled by his state legislature at any given point in time, and those state legislators are dealing with their constituents and are at a level very close to those constituents, um, they can uh, they can voice their concerns to this senator uh, much much more easily during those five years or the entire six year term of that senator's term in office uh, than than can the general electorate, and so that's the trade off. And so the question becomes, and both sides have debated this, right? Depending on who's in power, um, a lot of folks view the Senate as the place where good bills go to die. And I will tell you something, there is something to be said for, for that, because frankly, again, if we take this idea that the Constitution is a deliberative document 
and we're supposed to look before we leap, before we enact legislation or regulation or what have you, having a deliberative body like the United States Senate, which overly deliberates, is a good thing. But on the other hand, when we want to make changes, it can become a little more gridlocked. And so the idea is, if these senators were more directly responsible to state legislatures, would we get a better, more responsive United States Senate? Uh, and I think there's some merit to that. Um, I think, you know, anytime we've sort of tinkered with, uh, not anytime, in many instances in which we have tinkered with the Constitution's basic structure as the founders laid it out, we haven't really looked before we leapt and we've produced, so shall we say. Well, thank you for that great explanation. Uh, Mark DeRoba asks or makes an observation. He says, I suspect that meritocracy for government officials is much is a much different set of standards from the average citizen. Um, would you care to comment on? Yeah, I, I think that's probably true. I mean, the laws that are in place and part of this is also skewed because of um, uh, government employee unions and we can debate the constitutionality. I frankly think that government employee unions are unconstitutional for a whole host of reasons. But in the end, right, you have a, a, a set of skewed outcomes where they're really rising and falling on their own merits, but they're really rising because they've been in government for a certain period of time or because they fit a certain profile that, again, somebody has determined that they want uh, in, in office. Um, and, and again, it, it produces, it can produce skewed results in terms of governance if we're promoting people for the wrong reasons and not because they're really good at their jobs. Thank you. And one of our regular listeners, Sandy Thatcher, asks, in his Theory of Justice, 1970, Harvard professor John uh, Rawls articulated ah. the two principles of justice to balance meritocracy with the need for equal opportunity. Would you care to comment on that? Well, right. I mean, listen, Rawls has some great merit. He was a, 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 a brilliant philosopher. And in the end, right, the best way to guarantee opportunity is by giving people the tools by which they can succeed. Um, and that means engaging in a vigorous education. And we can debate the merits of education versus homeschooling. Well, I think we can all agree that our public education system needs to be massively improved. Um, and in the end, if you create a smarter electorate, and also, by the way, an electorate um, it, which sort of understands that not everybody needs to go to college, and that there are skills that people have that may not translate academically, but you have a certain um, fluency, I should say, there's another word that's escaping me, a certain fluency in terms of how you understand the way society works, um, that, that you can succeed in this world and sort of you can uh, voice you know, your, your part in how this world works. Uh, we, we want that. Uh, and I think, don't think anybody is, is saying that we don't want that. In fact, I think the one area where we can all agree, uh, no, regardless of where we sit on the political spectrum, is that we need to have a much better educated citizenry. It's how we go about doing that. Uh, that's the real problem. Well, thank you for that. We are right at the top of the hour. I do want to get our one of our teachers uh, from the Mansfield Classical Academy had a question if we could do that one real sure. quick. Uh, he's asking about uh, DEI and SEL in government uh, education in the corporate world and how these policies might tear down the idea of meritocracy. And is this purposeful? Well, it is purposeful. I mean, listen, I, not that I want to get all, all, all political here uh, on this, but, but this gets to the heart of changing the idea of what's considered success, what's considered merit, and what sort of values we are trying to promote. Um, when you have it, it, the, one of the problems, especially with, with DEI, um, is that nobody can nobody can agree, right? We, had, we went through a whole debate. Again, I don't want to get all political, um, but we went through a whole debate for a couple of years about defining what uh, uh, CRT is, critical race theory is. And no matter what, you know, the definition that somebody used, somebody else would say that that definition is wrong. Well, that's purposeful because if you, if you have some kind of an amorphous system that is sort of governing uh, the way people are taught and, and the, you know, governing uh, who determines doesn't, who gets promoted and who doesn't, who advances and who doesn't, well, then they can always gin the system uh, with whatever standards that, that they want. Uh, that's that's a, a problem. And I think it is by design because in the end, again, when you turn people against each other, uh, when you when you go and you make up systems that, uh, um, that require people to mouth the right slogans, again, you know, hearkening to whatever communist system you want, um, it makes it much, much easier to control the populace. 
right? That and that's and we we should as free Americans be deeply deeply troubled by that. Well, thank you, and Thanks. we just thank you so much. Great, great show, and um, we're past our time, but thank you, Andrew. We always do for Constitution America and our and our programs. I need a new new router. <laughs> well, we want to thank our audience so much for all your great questions, and we hope you'll join us next week. Tuesday at 2 Eastern, we're going to be talking about the principle of citizenship. So we really look forward to having you back uh, with us next week. And Andrew, thank you so much. And um, thank you to our panel. As always, guys. Thank you. Y'all have a great week. Bye.